grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the sermon this morning, we consider not only the first two parables of Luke chapter 15, but also the third parable, which is found in the last part, and I will read that for uh, the sermon this morning. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. And Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the paws that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed, there are some odd things about these three parables. For example, in the first one, the shepherd leaves 99 sheep to go after just one. You might say from a a business perspective, he risks everything to go after the one. Businessmen, they, they expect that everything will work. They expect a loss sometimes, and 1% isn't a whole lot. And so it's just a little bit odd that he will leave the 99 and go after the one. Another odd thing about the first two parables is that we see both the shepherd and the woman who lost the coin. When they find the lost sheep, and when they find the lost coin, they're not just relieved and thankful. They have this rejoicing party where they bring in friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me. It almost seems like it's over the top. You know, you lose a silver coin, you find it, you bring in your neighbors and your friends and lose the lamb or sheep and you find it and you bring in your neighbors and friends to have a great celebration. Again, a a little bit odd, a little bit strange. But the point is this. If the woman and the shepherd 
And when they find what they lost, valuable as it is, when they find what they lost and they celebrate to the degree that they do, how much more so when a son is lost, a human being, a person is lost, and then is found? The rejoicing, Jesus tells us, in heaven is something we can't even imagine. I mean, it would be amazing to be in heaven and to hear God and all of heaven and all of the angels rejoicing over just one sinner who was lost and who repents and is found. So that's the point here. But I want to spend most of our time on the third parable, the parable of the lost son, sometimes called the prodigal son, but we'll call him the lost son this morning, as is used in our text. And there are a couple odd things about this parable that aren't found in the other two parables. First of all, the son does not deserve to be found, let alone rejoice over and embraced and kissed and clothed and fed and welcomed by his father. For unlike the coin, especially, but also unlike the sheep, this son made his own choice to be lost. He owns his leaving. He owns his rebellion. He owns his sin and rejection of his father. And yet, he ends up getting what he does not deserve. As he himself said, I'm not worthy, Father, to be called your son. And so what we have here in this son is a very apt and appropriate description of of all who have repented, of all who are true Christians, of all who have been brought to repentance. Martin Luther, uh, when he died in 1546 at the age of 64, when he died of a heart attack, they found a, a note in his pocket. And the note said, Dear Sind Detler, Das ist wahr. We are beggars. This is true. You and I, we have owned our lostness. We own, we have owned our rebellion. We have owned our sin. And so we, we say with the lost son of our text, and you hear him say, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. And then when he finally comes to his father, he says the same thing. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. We are beggars. This is true. And here's the good news. When the Father sees him, the Father's thought is not finally this wayward son is coming home. He's got some explaining to do. He's going to owe me. The, the Father, what? He has compassion on him. He runs. He embraces him. He kisses him. 
And again, the son confesses right then, I'm not worthy. I'm a beggar father. But again, the father doesn't say at that point, well, if you're going to be my son, you've got to get your act together. You've got to clean up your life. You've got to start working to earn your keep. You've got to start acting like your older, well-behaved brother. Now the father says, get that best robe and put it on him. A robe for a noble son. Put a ring on his finger that says he's mine, he's my royal son. And let's have a feast like never before. We're going to invite our friends and our neighbors. We're going to celebrate. Again, you and I, we're we're like the lost son. By choice, we have owned our leaving. We have owned our rebellion. We have owned our sin. So what happened to us? Well, we were brought to this thing called repentance. Or as our text says, we were brought to our senses. What am I doing? Look at me. I've rejected God. In other words, we're just telling ourselves and telling God the truth. Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. I'm not worthy. I'm just a beggar. Give me a crumb. That's all. And again, our, our Father in heaven, He sees us. And He doesn't say, oh, oh no, not, not Him, not her. He doesn't turn His back on us. He doesn't shake His finger on us, at us and say, shame on you, shame on you for what you've done. He doesn't look at our rebellion. He only sees that we were lost. And now we're home. He only sees and has compassion. And to explain that compassion more carefully, we have to leave the parable here for a little bit and and see where that compassion is is displayed and accomplished. And that means we, we go to the passion of Christ. Where God is saying to us, you know, my, my compassion has been so great for you sinners that I gave my other son, not the other son in the parable, but God's other true son, the eternal one. And we go to his passion, where we read at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He put a sponge full of sour wine on the hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then calling out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And the temple of the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, the centurion said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Again, the Father is saying to us, I love you. I have compassion on you. I gave my son for you. So those he has brought to repentance and faith in the Father's love in Christ. That Father runs to us. He embraces us. He kisses us. Even while we're saying, I'm not worthy. 
I'm just a beggar. And he says, it doesn't matter. And he clothes us with the righteousness of his son. He puts a ring on our finger. And he says, you're mine. You're mine. You're my royal son and daughter. He says, there's going to be a feast like never before. And we can't hear it. And we can't see it now. But there is a huge rejoicing party taking place in heaven with God and all of heaven and all the angels. Because we've been brought to repentance and faith. You and I were dead, but we're alive. We were lost, but we are found. One other odd thing about this third parable, and this is uh, important when it comes to the subject of evangelism. With the lost sheep and the lost coin, you have the shepherd going out and looking. You have the woman uh, lighting a lantern and sweeping and, and looking diligently, searching diligently. So what about the third parable? You would expect that the father would get on a horse or at least tell a servant to go out and start seeking for his lost son. But it's not there. Or is it? It actually is there. Especially when you look at the rest of Scripture. God the Father does go out and seek diligently, persistently. But not in a way that we would necessarily understand and expect. But He does. In our parable, again, the son says, give me my portion of the inheritance. I'm gone. I have no regard to you anymore, Father. What does Father do? So, okay. You're gone. Now, for those of us who have children, we kind of understand this sometimes. Our children can sometimes make choices and uh, sometimes we have to say, okay, it's your choice. And uh, it can be very, very painful. And we give this different names when it happens. We say, well, they're going to have to learn through the school of hard knocks. Or we say they have to lie in the bed they made it. They have to lie in the bed they made. Or we even say, um, we have to let them wallow in the mud. And that's kind of what God does with lost sinners. Say, Paul puts it uh, this way in Romans 1. And it's not pleasant the way Paul puts it. <clears throat> but he says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And then he says this, and this is where the evangelism comes in, and it's kind of strange. Therefore, God gave them over. He says this three times. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. You're going to reject me as God? Okay. I'm going to give you over to your sinful desires. And he mentions three categories of sins. He mentions sexual immorality. He mentioned shameful lust, 
which is homosexuality. He mentions, then he mentions all kinds of sin. He mentions the depraved mind, wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, disobedience towards parents. I'm going to give you over. Like the son in the parable. He was kind of given over. So that he might have to wallow in the mud. So that he might have to struggle. So that he would suffer. Until when? He'd finally wake up. And what am I doing? Until, as the parable says, he was driven to his senses. Until he understood, I have sinned against heaven and against God. I'm not worthy. Whether we like it or not, that is, that is the way God often works with those who are lost. You and I, um, we are allowed to continue on this earth as long as God gives us so that we might simply love our neighbor. And sometimes that means we have to, to watch and wait while our loved ones, our, our neighbors, our friends, whomever, wallow and struggle and suffer. And we ought to help them in, in ways that we can when we have opportunity. But we shouldn't be surprised if God does allow them to, to wallow and suffer and struggle. For God's pushing them. He said, wake up. Come to your senses. God is seeking the lost. Wanting them to confess with us. I'm not worthy. I'm a beggar. And then if God does bring them to that point, He wants them to hear this other message as well. The message that you and I may have opportunity to share with them. He wants them to hear from our lips or somebody's lips, the Father in Heaven now wants to embrace you with the same arms that He has embraced me. The Father only has compassion for you because of His Son. The Father wants to clothe you and He has available for you this beautiful garment, this robe of forgiveness for you. And so... Uh, my brothers and sisters, we should always remember that this work of God, where He brings people to repentance and faith and clothes us and says, You're my, that's where we are. We, we have that. We are there. We were lost, and now we are found. But we should also be in tune to the reality that. Now, God works in harsh ways sometimes. He allows people to struggle and wallow and suffer so that at some point, those others along with us may say, we are beggars. And when they, and we say that, and we're embraced with the love of God in Christ, That rejoicing party is a reality. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith 
in Christ Jesus. Amen.